Thank you very much for your welcome, and it's nice to be back in Gresham College. Um, I'm going to sort of crack through this. It'll be a bit of a, a romp, um, uh, but I want to make sure that we see as much as possible uh, on our journey before we finish at two. We need patterns, and we also like patterns. Certain sorts of pattern give us the power to predict what will come next and to adapt accordingly. And this can contribute hugely to our well-being. Seeing patterns in the behavior of the elements and of other natural forces, and seeing patterns in the behavior of one another. These things have been crucial to humankind's success as a species. Moreover, the use of patterns in the functional things we make, the arches that support a viaduct, for example, and that distribute its weight, will often be essential to making them functional and often safe. The patterning of arches in what you see here is crucial to the survival of those who cross it. As it happens, these patterned arches are also, in my view, very beautiful. But my guess is that the architect of this viaduct did not have their beauty as his principal aim when he designed it. A beautiful viaduct that you couldn't actually use to cross the valley would be a folly and a dangerous one at that. Now, it may, of course, be that the reason we like patterns is because we need them. This is something about which psychologists and maybe also evolutionary biologists are likely to have views. This lecture, however, is going to ask a different set of questions, ones in which my own discipline of theology has had a perennial interest. Those questions are, what are some of the roles that pattern has played in art, and what are some of the key ways in which artists in Western culture have understood their art's use and occasionally rejection of patterns as a way of responding to God. Please notice my judicious use of the word some here. The topic is vast and quite impossible of coverage in just 45 minutes. It's also far too big a topic to be covered authoritatively by any one person. So please treat what I'm about to say as a series of exploratory proposals which invite all sorts of further qualification and refinement. And perhaps you will be able to begin to do that necessary qualifying and refining in your comments and questions at the end. One of the great dilemmas of the modern period is our loss of faith in the relationship between the good, the true, and the beautiful. Our ancestors in pre-modern times, by which I mean pre-16th century times, simply assumed a connection between them. It was something they would have taken for granted without feeling the need to justify or prove it. But we have since begun to doubt that there's a necessary connection, and we can't imagine anything that would prove such a connection. There are many reasons for this onset of doubt, but a significant one is the increased tendency of us moderns to locate concepts like beauty in the eye of the beholder in our own minds, rather than out there, as it were, in an objective order of things. Something is beautiful for us, rather than beautiful in itself, to uh, echo Kant. Moreover, on this account, there cannot be any intrinsic link between the beautiful and the good or the true, only the arbitrary associations that I choose to make between things I like and things I value without any appeal to their existence independently of me. What makes us and our dilemmas so very different from those of the medieval period is that medieval people, including the most brilliant intellectuals of those centuries, thought that beauty and goodness, like truth and like being itself, which was the reality in which all the others were grounded, were transcendental realities. That's to say they were intrinsic and necessary aspects of each existent thing in so far as that thing participated in the being and purpose which God gave it. A true thing was a true thing, a good thing a good thing, and a beautiful thing a beautiful thing, regardless of whether a human being was there to look at it, experience it, or form an opinion about it. The true, the good, and the beautiful were properties of being transcendental properties of being. Such being is not something we make or guarantee, 
Being is made by and guaranteed from somewhere else, by another with a capital A. And if that creative guaranteeing other with a capital O is a good God, then whatever is, is also good, true and desirable, which is to say attractive or beautiful, by virtue of its existing at all. It all comes from the same place, and that place is other than the inside of our heads. For anything to be is for it to be from the self-communicating goodness of God. Being and goodness are thus inseparable, mutually convertible, to use the language of the scholastics, and are grounded together with the true and the beautiful in God, who is ultimate reality. This is the sort of idea that we find emerging in the work of the mystical writer Pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite, writing in about 500 AD, probably in Syria. And after him, in a more codified way, St. Bonaventure, writing in the 13th century, who speaks as follows. I can't remember if I've put the quote. No, I haven't got the quotation there. That's a rather nice Blakeian echo of that medieval image of God, the architect of the cosmos. Oh, I do have the quotation. Beauty is the great creating cause which bestirs the world and holds all things in existence by the longing inside them to have beauty. It is the cause toward which all things move, since it is the longing for beauty which brings them into existence. The beautiful is the same as the good, for everything looks to the beautiful and the good as the cause of being. And there is nothing in the world without a share of the beautiful and the good. This, the one, the good, the beautiful, is in its uniqueness the cause of the multitudes of the good and the beautiful. In other words, among creatures. The medieval Christian church was governed by this belief. In this, of course, it inherited a powerful Greek tendency in which Pythagoras, in the 4th or 5th century BC, was a key influence. A tendency to argue for a universe regulated in every respect by number and by ratios. In Pythagoras's words, all things are formed in accordance with harmony. These ratios are evident in the harmonious relations between musical notes, as they are also in the dimensions of admirable architecture. The Christian thinkers of the Middle Ages, influenced not only by these ideas, but uh, as mediated particularly by Boethius, but also by St. Augustine's treatise on music, for example, De Musica, which in being about music is also about mathematics, and in being about both of those is also about divine providence. These thinkers in the Middle Ages were consistent advocates of the idea of cosmic proportion and pattern. The 12th century theologians of the school of Chartres saw in the cosmos an extraordinary, complex, and miraculous consensus among things, a mutual coherence and reciprocity that sustained their overall union. The cosmos, like the human being, to which it was often compared, had a single soul and a single destiny. Meanwhile, a single divine love held it in being and guided it in the right ways. God's good order is the opponent and bulwark against primordial chaos. Even ugly things could be part of this harmony of the world. Umberto Eco points this out, seeing a good example of the sort of argument, of this sort of argument, in the ninth century thinker John, uh, John Scotus Eriogena, who says that even contrast can be incorporated into a larger proportion scheme and can help to serve a more extended sense of beauty. Beauty also springs from the contrast of opposites, writes Umberto Eco, and thus even monsters have a reason and a dignity in the concept of creation. Alongside evil, good shines out all the better. Kilpeck Church in Herefordshire shows this dazzlingly. This is a detail from um, its, uh, one of its carved Romanesque doors. It shows a mysterious sharing and bonding between all created things. Some of them peculiar, grotesque even, some of them shocking, some of them delightful. You see the monster there on the right-hand side and the angel in the middle. 
and then a slightly fantastical bird on the left. These are examples of the way in which we see in Kilpeck's scheme, which holds them all together in a sort of communion, uh, a participatory beauty. The beauty of things very diverse and yet connected, relating, displaying their at-homeness with each other, all sharing in a sort of hymn of praise in which there is both light and shadow, both abstraction and figuration, and cuteness even, and both depth and surface. Some of you will know these, um, these delightful creatures on one of the corbels on the outside of Kilpec. The greatest of all medieval theologians, Thomas Aquinas, gives the idea of proportion a special importance and influence in his thought. We see this in his love of the word conveniens in Latin. Conveniens, which we can best translate, perhaps, in English as aptness. The idea of aptness permits an application of the idea of, the be of beautiful pattern as much to an ethical context as to an aesthetic one. Both artistic productions and holy actions are ways of mirroring and joining in with the patterns, the relations between things that are God's intention for his creation. Virtuous actions, writes Echo, describing Aquinas' views, bring about correctly proportioned words and deeds in accordance with a rational law. And so we must also talk of moral beauty. Beauty is the mutual collaboration between things and so we can define as beautiful the reciprocal action of stones that, by supporting one another, let's just look back at the church door there, which, by supporting one another and thrusting against one another, provide a building with a solid base. It's the correct relationship between the intelligence and the object that the intelligence comprehends. In other words, proportion becomes a metaphysical principle that explains the unity of the cosmos. There is, of course, a major issue lurking beneath the surface of such claims as these, and that is whether, even if you do accept that works of art should work to correspond in some way to a God-given order in things by striving to be beautiful, and few artists today will accept even this, even if you accept that, there's still a question about whether it's because they are patterned that they are beautiful. Pattern's relation to beauty is not to be taken for granted. And this is because ideas of beauty themselves are constantly changing. And only certain strands of aesthetic thought in certain periods of history have celebrated pattern, with which we might also associate ideas of proportion, symmetry, harmony, and so on, as the quintessence of the beautiful. As Nietzsche would point out hundreds of years later in the late 19th century, the Greeks did not only give us that kind of beauty which depends on pattern, proportion, and regular form, the kind of beauty Nietzsche calls Apollonian, it also gave us a different and intoxicating kind of beauty which we find in flux, song, and wild dance, the kind of beauty he calls Dionysian. And I want to come back to this when we look at some works of art from the modern period. Pattern in art is not, of course, just a matter of imitation of what is found in nature. It's also a sort of invention, which means both discovery in an old-fashioned usage of the word invention, and also creativity in its more typical modern usage. This idea that artistic work involves invention as well as imitation would have been acknowledged fully in the medieval period. But, as is often remarked, the inventiveness of artists seems to become more pronounced and more flamboyant and certainly less anonymous in the Renaissance. I want to turn now to three ways in which artists in the Christian tradition have used pattern creatively in order to illustrate theological truths. They are quite diverse examples, but together they show the power of pattern to be a sign of something beyond itself. One case has a powerful effect, though one I disapprove of on theological grounds, not aesthetic grounds, uh, and the other two I admire a good deal more. So my first of these three examples is 
the last judgment. And in fact, this is not the last judgment I want to criticize. It's actually the one I want to praise uh, and to contrast with the one I want to criticize. The magnificent mosaic of the last judgment in Torcello Cathedral, one of the islands of Venice, dating from around the 13th to the 14th centuries and reflecting from a variety of angles on the last things, drawing together a panoply of biblical images and images from Christian tradition into a composite picture. The images are arranged in strips, as you can see, in a downwards fashion. The first scene at the top shows uh, Christ uh, on the cross, at the very top, in the sort of, in the sort of pediment, uh, with Mary and St. John the Evangelist. And then uh, a little further down, we see Christ triumphing over evil and death. So he's trampling on the devil, a very large Christ compared to the figures around him, trampling uh, on the devil and smashing the gates into hell. In the next strip down, we uh, see Christ framed in a sort of mandala figure between the Virgin and John the Baptist in a classic formation of uh, Eastern Byzantine art called the Deesis. And... Uh, who are and the Virgin and the Baptist are pleading with Christ on behalf of humanity. And in keeping with certain passages in scripture and their interpretation, a river of fire descends from Christ's throne, nourishing the fires of hell much further down in the picture in the bottom right. And then the next layer down, still in the central section of this uh, huge wall, contains the throne of the triumph of the cross, and around that we see the instruments of the passion. And then at the sides we see two scenes from the resurrection of the dead. And underneath that a scene of the weighing of Christian souls. So that's the next tier down is the weighing of souls. The penultimate uh, uh, layer. And then in the very bottom we see the blessed on the left. And on the right uh, the souls of the damned in hell. There's a good deal more we could say about this. But what I want to draw your attention to is that the fact that there is pattern in this mosaic, but it hasn't resulted in an inappropriate imposition of a neatly patterned vision of how heaven and hell interrelate. It's, it's more of a sort of hodgepodge than that, a very interesting and wonderful hodgepodge, and I think appropriately cautious about introducing a false symmetry between... Uh, the place of the blessed and the place of the damned, of the sort that we see, sorry, that's the detail of the um, deesis in the middle of the mosaic, um, of the sort that we see in the last judgments of, say, Tintoretto, which you see here, or Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. That's my one topical reference indirectly to what's been going on in the last few days. While those are works of painterly genius they are not good Christian theology. The doctrines of heaven and hell in Christianity do not perform the same function as each other and are not a sort of quasi-geographical map of the afterlife. The idea of 50% of humanity going one way and 50% going the other is theologically presumptuous, even if visually satisfying. And this Tintoretto image divides halfway down. It is very definitely um, a, a sort of map, if you like, of this cosmic finality in which um, from the midpoint of the painting the souls are generally being drawn upwards and uh, uh, the other and less fortunate souls are being gradually slipping, sliding or being dragged downwards. The pattern is too clear and assumes a sort of God's eye view. Torcello's ambiguity has much to commend it by contrast and I should perhaps just add a note about why I think the doctrines of heaven and hell don't uh, perform the same function as each other. The reason is, it seems to me, that the doctrine of hell has a very specific role to play in terms of encouraging human beings, that we may not think it's a very good form of encouragement, but encouraging human beings to, to take seriously their own actions in this life and to realize that they have consequences and um, that, as it were, something hangs upon them. The doctrine of heaven holds open, uh, is, is a, it more a doctrine about the nature of the divine mercy. Um, one doctrine, in other words, is saying something about God and God's mercy. The other is addressing something to human beings about the nature of their actions. And in these two different and importantly different functions, the doctrines ought not to be translated, as I say, into some kind of visual map. 
That may be a controversial view, um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that later. But let's go on to my second example of how pattern can signify something theologically important. This I want to use to illustrate the uh, theological suggestiveness of perspective. It's well known that the artists of the Renaissance began to take a particular interest in perspective and to use it as a prized tool in their art. The treatises of the Florentine Leon Battista Alberti and others spend a great deal of time exploring and explaining its principles. It's often remarked that this is the beginning of a more mathematical, rationalistic, even humanistic science of painting. And the patterns of squares, the receding grids, which we see here particularly on the Virgin's side of this image by Filippo Lippi, which you can go and see in the National Gallery. These patterns of squares, these grids, that Alberti encouraged artists to use in structuring the space in their works may seem to have nothing religious, particularly religious, about them at all. And to some extent, that's true. And yet, they can also be used to signal something more. When we see a picture of the Annunciation to the Virgin, like this one, we're seeing a moment, theologically speaking, where infinity also occupies a point in space. The infinite divinity of the Son of God takes up residence in the hidden recesses of the Virgin's womb. There is a point which is also an infinity. That's if we read the painting horizontally, so to speak. But if we read the painting from our foreground into its background, the other axis, so to speak, then we see what could be the most wonderfully clever sign of that simultaneity of a point and of infinity, the vanishing point. Less precisely illustrated here perhaps than in some images, but nonetheless present by virtue of the perspective in the picture. Because the vanishing point is also a point which is also an infinity. Pattern in that sense becomes religiously eloquent and the fact that we also see a stairway that leads to a place we can't see, and then, in other words, in a different way, also suggests potentially an infinity or at least uh, something whose boundaries we, we can't command with our eye, adds, I think, too, to this sense that there is more here than we can see. It's a place, but it's a place that points beyond place. So that's my second example. And my third is another National Gallery painting Michelangelo's entombment. And in this glorious painting, Michelangelo gives us many mysteries to ponder. One of them is the fact that this Christ is unbloodied. He's dead, apparently, but has no wounds. And there are various reasons why that might be, that somehow Michelangelo may have felt that uh, suggesting the divinity of Christ. Uh, might require him to paint, as it were, an ideal body and an unblemished one. But even if there are no wounds in the body of Christ, I'm intrigued by the way that his body, held as it is in the space between the two figures to his left and right, almost sort of circling him, it's almost a dance-like movement, somewhat like the three graces. Um, this space that they form as they uh, support him creates the effect of uh, an almost chalice-like shape. The sides of their bodies curve downwards into a narrower stem around Christ's waist and then continue down as widening slightly at the base. So it's as if his body is cupped in a chalice. The figures lifting him up have patterned the space in a way that is deeply meaningful, especially in conjunction with an altar. Imagine this painting, imagine viewing this painting above an altar. And in that context, you might say, the blood of Christ is made present, though in an unexpected way, in this evocation of the Eucharistic blood. Well, as the Renaissance heralds the beginnings of a very different Western world and a more human-centered one, there remains a power in the Christian claim that the non-human natural world and human beings are to recall Aquinas' language once again, are mutually collaborative, fitted to one another appropriately in some way. Um, 
So the idea that the non-human natural world and human beings are fitted to one another appropriately in some way. And we see this, I think, in a work like Bellini's Agony in the Garden, in which if you look closely at it and spend time looking at it, it's almost as though the landscape has patterned itself to accommodate its human inhabitants. The natural feature of the large rock and the, the slope, the grassy slope that leads up to it, has become also, as it were, adapted to the use of the praying Christ, like some, as it were, enormous prie dieu. Um, the landscape, in other words, has almost molded itself to the needs of his body and of his prayer. Uh, the disciple who's uppermost of the three sleeping disciples, the line of his, um, of his arm, of his upper arm, then almost blends directly into the edge of that slope leading up to the prie -dieu. So there's a sense almost that the lines of the landscape are flowing in and out of the lines of the human bodies that inhabit it. It's a landscape that is, as it were, working with them in order to support and uh, shape them. And they, in turn, are helping to give fluidity and movement to the landscape. We could spend a great deal more time on this, but we don't have that time. But this, I do, I do think, um, expresses in a very um, beautiful way this adaptedness of the human beings and of the non-human world to one another. And it can work the other way around as well. Human beings can and do accommodate themselves to their natural surroundings. And uh, with the help of their patterns, uh, work upon their natural surroundings without necessarily betraying them. Here too, there can seem to be a sort of collaboration. We can see this receptivity and reciprocity in a garden like that at Sissinghurst in Kent. The fact that human ideas help to order the non-human nature there doesn't do violence necessarily to the nature, as it might have done if there were only, reg only regimented borders and relentlessly geometrical clips, shrubs. There are some, as you can see, there are some uh, geometrical features in this garden and also uh, some aspects of it that allow it to break its boundaries and run wild. So there's not necessarily violence to nature here so much as a sense that nature, in its interactions with the human loves that are at work in the garden, nature is being enabled in some special way to be itself and more than itself in its relationship with the human beings who work there and live there. Sissinghurst, like the Bellini painting, may help us to appreciate what Samuel Taylor Coleridge meant when he said that art is beautiful when it makes the external internal and the internal external. When we find what we've discovered inside us actually outside us too. The respectful affinity between different living things displays the at-homeness that I think the language of beauty has sometimes sought to name and to express. Often, of course, a sense of affinity like that is something that seems beyond our grasp. And it's here that we turn much more definitely to the modern period, asking what has been the fate of pattern in the work of modern artists who are more often than not unpersuaded by religious beliefs about the good order and benevolence of the world. What is proposed by many modern artists and commentators on art is a celebration of the merely subjective value of art. The subjective can be made so complete a criterion of value that public standards of beauty, truth or goodness are simply bypassed as irrelevant or fictional. No common good is articulated in artistic terms. Just like individual religious experience, individual artistic experience gets privatized and denies the need for any other legitimation. Here lies the biggest tension between the ethos of modern aesthetics and that of Christian theology. And it's the root of the reason why, to the modern mind, the idea of there being any link between art and God seems an extremely peculiar one. The modern difficulty, if we accept that it is a difficulty, is therefore the result of a loss of a certain kind of faith in the actual coherence and benevolence of the world and in the possibility that we might actually be capable of experiencing it in a way that's genuinely shared by others, that their good might also be my good, and that what I desire might actually be compatible with what they desire, without competition or violence. Ours, you might say, and it's been said often, is a disenchanted world. It is no longer the world in which Dante wrote his divine comedy, which is the story of a great ascent into divine reality, 
where there's perfect congruence between the most perfect good and the most perfect beauty, where the most pure is also the most passionately desirable. Our passions are disenchanted passions, usually directed at things that seem idiosyncratic and perhaps a little grubby. And we don't dare talk much about the transcendentals anymore. I chose this image from Francis Bacon particularly because of the way that it actually does use pattern almost in order to subvert it. The, the, uh, the sides of this split carcass, um, of course, are symmetrical and, and so in some sense echo a world in which uh, symmetry and proportion were part of beauty. But uh, in itself, it's also a horrifying image. So whatever might have been given to us in terms of uh, an optimism about uh, the, well, the well-proportioned world we live in is at the same time shown to us as a symmetry revealed only through an act of violence. And the fact that, to me at least, these two sides of the carcass uh, look a bit like a parody of angels' wings um, it makes the point even more forceful. It's the idea of art's autonomy that most distinguishes the modern view from the medieval. And this is outlined well by Philip Blond, theologian and political thinker. He contrasts the modern situation with the medieval world in which, as he says, in the medieval world, art was seen as extolling and to some extent extending the relationship that God had to nature and man. Art mediated and further crafted our receptions of God's universal order of creation. The medieval notion of art was anything but autonomous. The beautiful was the incarnated form present, however incipiently, in all creation. The beautiful, therefore, had its place in the world as part of the order and character of all creatures. Beauty was objective in that it was imprinted in the form of the created world. For the medieval world, human aesthetic achievement was only possible insofar as it mirrored divine beauty. It's the idea of art's autonomy that, as I say, that most distinguishes the modern view from that one. This can be seen, perhaps, in the independence accorded to art in our own secular culture, largely secular culture. Many assume modern art must be automatically granted a self-governing sphere in order that it can function free of external restraints. But this poses several problems. To argue that modern aesthetics presupposes the fundamental autonomy of art is to argue for art's separation not only from God, but also from any external source of value or governance. Philip Blond writes, contemporary theory sees no relationship between art and morality, or indeed truth, let alone God. Art is not good or true or even beautiful. It is just art. Aesthetic practice provides its own grounds and requires no other apology. Self-proclaimed important movements in the visual arts actually account for their worth via an insistent refusal of public standards of form and beauty. Instead, the modern painter prefers to think of herself as radical, shocking, and most importantly of all, innovative. In short, criteria for judging the aesthetic value of modern art are thought to be personal, subjective, and somehow invented along with the work of art itself. Critics may argue that these invented rules exist parasitically on the public frameworks they refuse. Yet this riposte also fails to dislodge the autonomy of modern art, as all public works now appear to be as relative and as unjustifiable as the private values they initially hoped to mitigate. That's Philip Blond, and you can take a copy of this away, I think, as you go, if you want to read that. There's a lot in that paragraph. So how do we get here from there, so to speak? How do we get from the objective to the subjective in our uh, account of what art is and our account of how we respond to it? Well, one reason may have to do with industrialization. The technological tools that man progressively made available to himself in the 18th and 19th centuries ran on pattern and served pattern, at least in the sense of the faithful and predictable replication of a prototype. Look at those boxes going along the production line. Our culture, and that includes our artists, live under the sway of this technocratic world still. And when pattern begins to seem more a feature of a machine-governed world than a God-governed world, perhaps it isn't so surprising that art develops as a sort of reaction to it, to pattern. The handmade, the anomalous, the one-off, 
even if they're patterns within them, take on heightened value. Of course, the work of William Morris in his workshop was partly an attempt to return to the handmaid, of course still incorporating pattern, but insisting that uh, the, that the one-off had an enormous and intrinsic value, that which was made particularly for a place, which is why a lot of Morris's wallpapers are hand-painted. In this world, art, rather than being a bulwark against chaos, as in medieval times, becomes a bulwark against sameness. But there were other developments afoot, too, which helped to explain why art has moved so far in the modern period from its medieval heritage. John Ruskin may have wanted to assert that nature's patterns sing the praises of God and even show us aspects of God's own nature, and that art, in imitating nature well, serving nature well, also helps to uh, praise God and show us aspects of God's order. Others, like Oscar Wilde, disagreed. We surely hear a bit of Wilde himself in one of his characters when he exclaims, nature is so uncomfortable, so indifferent, so unappreciative. Whenever I'm walking in the park, I always feel that I'm no more to her than the cattle that browse on the slope or the burdock that blooms in the ditch. And though humorous, this sentiment captures quite a profound modern doubt or indeed unease about whether we are either significant or safe in a world so apparently capable of arbitrary cruelty or disorder. This arbitrariness and disorder is discernible in the nature within us as well as the nature around us. And the devastation of the global wars of the early 20th century will make a relish of pattern seem like escapism into an artifice, a comfort zone for the mind and the senses. Good art must be honest, and to be honest, it must not console, or not too rapidly. Now, although I quoted Blonde at length, and although his critique has undeniable force, it is polemical, and it doesn't catch all of modern art in its net. To the extent that much of it, as you'll see if you wander around a collection like that in Tate Modern, much of it does at the very least see itself as a matter of response to the world and not just assertion, subjective assertion. This response may be to nature or to other human persons or to social change or to something else again. But where there is response, there is some kind, some notion of accountability or adequacy to what is beyond the artist. And there's often, still, pattern. So in the final part of this lecture, I want to consider some local examples of this in the sense that you can go and see them easily uh, and show that the contrast between medieval and modern cannot be drawn quite so starkly as Blonde draws it. We're faced more with complexity than contrast here. And there's a lot to enjoy and celebrate in the complexity. Well, first of all, I, I showed you the uh, William Morris just a moment ago. Uh, uh, and here we have Jackson Pollock's enormously long canvas, Summertime. What's interesting is that this uh, was uh, one of uh, Pollock's attempts to create a work of art without too much intervention of his own in, um, sort of conscious intention. So it was a work that he produced by dancing in a semi-trance-like state on the canvas, holding paintbrushes which scattered paint around uh, in accordance with his own physical movements in the, in the movement of the dance. Uh, and then having made all the swirling figures uh, with the spattering paint in this way, he then filled in certain of the um, spaces that were created between the lines of paint. And this is what resulted. The attempt was, as it were, to channel something almost directly from um, uh, a subconscious uh, a subconscious uh, being and a, and a physical aspect of his nature straight onto the canvas without, as it were, introducing uh, reflective thought into it. Um, and in some way, in doing that, also to express something directly natural. Pollock famously once, when asked um, whether he felt he was painting nature, said, I am nature. Um, and here there's an attempt to make that nature which he is uh, represented somehow directly on, on the canvas. But it produces patterns. 
and they're patterns that may not be entirely possible to contrast with some of the patterns we might have seen in works that are far more deliberate and uh, self-conscious from an earlier period. And here we see an example of Piet Mondrian's work, one of those classic canvases using its verticals and horizontals and colored blocks in order to try and, as he himself admitted, to try and discover a sort of universal language of art, that one that would transcend different cultures and transcend different historical periods by, as we're getting to a pure essence of abstraction. The idea that abstraction itself could become the basis of a universal visual language. But what I find fascinating is uh, looking back at some of Mondrian's early uh, pre-abstract and more figurative uh, works in which, because he's from a rather flat part of Europe, um, often precisely work with verticals and horizontals, as you can see here in the upright trunks of the trees and the horizontal footbridge across this very, very straight canal. This is also a natural landscape as well as a humanly made landscape in which verticals and horizontals are working representatively. And so the straightforward division between this, uh, this world of abstraction and the world of representation is not as easy to draw uh, as we might initially think. And here's a great example of a work of Dadaism. Dadaism exploring the fact that there really might be no order in the world but only chance. But even this sense of a, a world in which chance rules or governs, uh, which the Dadaists were trying to capture in their works, has in a peculiar way an affinity with something like the works uh, using found objects that Jim Ede put together in his home at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. And Ede's sense was not that he lived in a world of mere chance, although finding things, that sense of found objects, is of course has some element of the uh, unplanned and the unexpected about it. But Eve's own view was that in these findings and the, as the assembling of things in this sort of way, uh, one was at the same time encountering a world which was almost sacramentally communicative of something. Every object opened beyond itself to the giver of that object. Um, and he was fascinated by the way in which these objects uh, interacted in a way that's very similar to the Bellini image and the Sissinghurst image, that tradition of thinking of human interaction with the world as one of an interaction of related things who can, as it were, make more of one another by interacting. Uh, Ede uh, worked with these found objects in the belief that they disclosed, meaningfully disclosed aspects of, um, of the world's beauty and order and delight. Here are some other objects, some other examples. In other words, these are responsive uses of found objects, not just assertive, shocking, and innovative ones. They're ones which connect us more deeply to the world and don't simply assert the artist's genius over against it, showing that the artist can do whatever he or she likes uh, and that the main job of artistry is simply to change the world into, from one thing into another. Here it's more a question of responding and drawing out what's already there. This is a painting that hangs in Kettle's Yard by Jim Ede's friend, David Jones, the painter and poet. Iwona Blaswick and Francis Morris, writing in Tate Modern, the handbook, importantly expose and resist the way that the authority of the museum tends to transform history into nature. In other words, to elevate something historical, a work of art's appeal or importance in a particular time, uh, into something trans or supra-historical. When you put it in a museum, you're sort of saying that this is uh, a sent, a captures the essence of something rather than shows us a moment in history. They write, the international civic and social status of the large institution ensures that the art it collects comes to represent a canon, an official pantheon of greatness. Such institutions create master narratives which assert aesthetic values and historical accounts as objective, autonomous and universal. Well, one of the things that as a modern and not a medieval theologian I appreciate in contemporary discussion of the arts is the emphasis on relativizing and contextualizing works of art rather than imbuing them with some sort of absolute or timeless status as great works. Theology ought to have a healthy resistance to claims to absolute and timeless authority 
unself-critical claims which don't admit the provisionality and contingency of their foundations. The messiness of history is not avoidable from a Christian perspective. It needs instead to be worked with in the belief that blessing can be disclosed in that messiness. But this does not, of course, mean that there's no place for pattern at all. Pattern will simply be part of a more complex, tentative, perhaps provisional way of responding to the world, as we see here in the delicate lines and tracery of David Jones's pencil and watercolour pictures. Non-human nature is still something to which we can be accommodated and in which we can find deep pleasure, but there's no sense in these paintings that we're being presented with a map of cosmic order. There is, in Vexilla Regis, this painting, for example, there is a sense that the world and its history has some sort of watermark running through it, the three crosses of Golgotha rendered as trees structuring the center, the center of, the, of the picture. But this world is also littered with rubble and ruins, ragged, particular, unique, loose ends. Particulars, not patterns, are the artist's principal concern. But it is in these particulars, like Jim Eads found objects, that a sort of sacramental sense of the divine giver and sustainer of the messy, violent, and enchanting world can communicate itself. Here, another of his images, in which ordinary found objects participate in this, well, rather, again, Eucharistic sort of uh, symbolism in the glass chalices. I want to finish with Matisse's Joy of Life. This is a work that is enigmatic, sensual, vivid. It expresses the earthly pleasures of curiosity, companionship, dance, relaxation, delight in nature, music, drawing, love, all in a natural clearing which is framed by arching trees. Matisse may be said simply to have decorated reality here, but I think he's done more than that. He's created a concentrated space in which reality is shown to us in a heightened register, in its dynamism and potential. And he seeks to engross us in this concentrated space, overcoming our tendency to want to stand outside the painting as though we're mere observers. A more intense historical sensibility is at work here, as in Jones, than perhaps the pre-modern world had. And a greater discomfort with the way that pattern can be co-opted and deadened by a modern logic of sameness. Together, these things have produced in modern artists a more idiosyncratic and bespoke relationship to pattern. There's also a needful suspicion of the way that patterns can console and in so doing protect us deceptively from some of the truths of our world and our own natures. But pattern persists. Matisse has patterned this space, though not with some rigid Apollonian template in which ratio is the only means to the manifestation of God. He's instead captured something at once Apollonian and Dionysian. The multidimensional dynamism of the world, expressed through line, color, distortion, and vibrating forms. And he experiences in this attention a lightness of spirit, which he then communicates to us, the engrossed viewer. It is a lightness of spirit, a joy in life, which is rarely found in the narrow formalisms of modern existence and rationality. And so the painting opens room for deep meditation on the dynamics of God in human life as a whole. For Christianly speaking, there is no sharp distinction between the lightening of spirit we find here and the Holy Spirit through which the joy of life rises in the human heart. This may, as a result, be a more religious painting than any number of worthily rendered scriptural scenes. And there I will stop.